Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. How many of you are baking a turkey right now? Confession. Just uh, write your address on a piece of paper and leave it behind, and I will be there to bless the food. Okay? Sound good? Glad you're here, whether that's in person or online. We're so thankful that you're tuning in to this series that we're doing through the entire month of October called Stretched Thin. We're trying to take a biblical look at what does it mean to be whole? What does it mean to be healthy? What does holiness mean in our whole entire health strategy? Emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, where could we be? Last week we talked about part one of our mental health journey, and that was focusing in on anxiety. And in this day, we're actually going to be looking at depression. Uh, sometimes it's easy to be thankful for stuff. On days like today, we can be like, oh my goodness, I love that somebody in our family knows how to cook or knows somebody to cook. We can be thankful for our jobs. We can be thankful for our family, our friends. We can be thankful that a crisis that we were in has now resolved itself. We can be thankful for those things. But there are times, if we're honest, there are times where it's very difficult for us to be thankful. We've got a diagnosis that happened that we weren't expecting or planning for, and it's going to impede our ability to enjoy life. We're not thankful for that. We got a tax bill that showed up in the mail that we don't know where it came from. We're definitely not thankful for that. We're frustrated about some things maybe your teenagers or your grandkids are making t choices that you don't agree with and you're, you're hurt by and we're frustrated. Sometimes, if we're honest, it is very difficult to be thankful. Some of us have people living in our houses that we wish would just go home. I don't know who they might be, but they might be in this room. Sometimes it's hard to be thankful. One in eight Canadians struggles with depression. Depression from a moderate to severe landscape. And at some point in time in your life, you might end up knowing a person that struggles with depression, or you yourself might be somebody who struggles with depression. A basic definition for this term, and it's not a full definition, so don't crucify me when you're like, oh, there's multiple layers to this thing. A basic definition is somebody who is struggling with the lowest of lows from an emotional perspective. And they just can't get out from that pit or that valley or that crevice that they find themselves in. That's what depression looks like and feels like. That's what depression means. And from that standpoint, what I want to do is I want to invite us into an adventure to uncover what does the Bible say about moments and in times and seasons where we are just that. Where we feel depressed by the circumstances around us, by the people around us, by what we see in the mirror. What do we do with all that stuff? And so that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at the life of Solomon Solomon is a character from the Bible who had everything. Here's just some of his highlights from his resume. He was uh, one of the richest people to have ever lived on the world, in the world. Even today, from archaeolo archaeologists are finding evidence to the degree of how wealthy this individual was. All of these thousands of years later, they're still uncovering the, the breadth of how much belonged to him. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's crazy. For a number of reasons, one of which is kind of, you know, you devalue the other gender when you keep adding to the mix. That's not very awesome, but that was his quorum. He had a thousand individuals that he was responsible for. Partners. He was known as one of the wisest people to have ever lived. There are, there are tales in scripture and there are tales in other historical documents of people who would go to Solomon and seek his counsel, seek his wisdom and his input on various challenges that they were facing either personally, situationally, or even as an entire people group. They were wanting his perspective, his insight, his wisdom. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, he wrote three books of the Bible. 
Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. He himself was also a rainbow baby. What does that mean? His parents conceived a child. That child did not live. He was the child that his parents conceived after that moment, and he lived. In common, common language today, we call that a rainbow baby, somebody who is given maybe in place of the one that we lost. So these are just some of his character qualities and highlights and things on his resume. And yet, Solomon himself was somebody who I believe struggled with depression. If you have got a Bible, I want to encourage you to turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. It's kind of right in the middle of your Bible, so you can try to like open right to the middle and hopefully you land right on the page. If not, you can nudge the person beside you and maybe they'll help you navigate towards that. If you don't have a Bible, today we want to gift one to you as a Thanksgiving present. Come find me after the service and we will gift one. It will also be on the screen. I'm going to be reading the first 11 verses, and I think you'll get a picture as to why I think Solomon was somebody who struggled with depression. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows again flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description, no matter how much we see. We are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past and in future generations. No one will remember what we are doing now. If that's not a picture of somebody who's struggling with depression, I don't know what it is. So why would God allow this to be written in his story, his word? Why would he want us to be aware of the depth that some people and maybe even some of us feel when it comes to this idea of our mental well-being and depression? I think it's because we need to know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. See, living a whole life, I know we all can feel stretched thin at different moments. How many times can you answer the same question to a group of people that that desire to hear the answer, it's probably exhausting. Imagine if those group of people live in your household and they keep asking you the same question. Can I have more screen time? Can I have more screen time? Can I have more screen time? Hypothetically speaking. It's exhausting. It's frustrating. We don't know what to do with it. And it's in those moments of emotional turmoil and frustration and mental stress that we need to know that there is a way forward. There's three things from this text that I want to highlight that I think will help us when we struggle on a personal level and even on a communal level when it comes to the idea of being depressed. First is this. When we put our hope and faith and trust in temporary things, we will always be disappointed. When we put our hope, our faith, and our trust in temporary things, we will always be disappointed. How many of you have ever had a piece of chocolate cake before? (laughs) Did you know that there are some places in the world that pair chocolate with insects and call it a delicacy? You imagine having a chocolate cake, it looks super great, it's placed right in front of you, regardless if you are gluten tolerant or not, it is made just for you. You take that first yummy bite into it and you hear a crunch. (laughs) 
followed by another crunch and then an ooze of something in your mouth. And you're thinking, this has gone really wrong. Sometimes I think that's exactly the picture of what happens in our lives when we put our faith in temporary things. If I just get this promotion, everything's going to be okay. If I finally get the raise that I've been waiting for, everything's going to be okay. If that person that I've declared that I love reciprocates love for me, then I'm going to be okay. If my children will just clean their room without me asking, I'm going to be okay. Those temporary things will always fade. Right now, maybe you're, when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, you see uh, something that is a picture of the, the epitome of health. Everything is going exactly as you had hoped and planned. Nothing is sagging yet. Nothing is receding yet. You look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, mm-hmm. This is a good day. Be wary, because this too shall fade. <laughs> You'll wake up one morning and you won't like what you see anymore. You'll be frustrated with where you are. Your, your circumstances will not be a blessing anymore. They'll become a burden. The people in your life, the prayers that you prayed for friendships, those friends will now become enemies for whatever reason. Maybe it's because you were fighting over who got access to what seat in the vehicle. When we put our hope in temporary things, it fades. This is exactly what we are learning from the life of Solomon. This is a dude that had everything. Nothing, nothing was withheld from him. All the money in the world, all the riches in the world, all the fame in the world, and even all the sex in the world. All of this, nothing was withheld from him, and he still pens these words. Everything is meaningless. Why? Because when we put our hope in temporary things, we will always be disappointed. And far too often in our world today, that is the reality. Instead of making Jesus central, we have Jesus as our side piece. Something that we access when we feel a moment of panic or pain or frustration or when we want a benefit of some kind. We treat him like a friend with benefits, not as king of our lives. Now, if you're here today going like, I don't even know who Jesus is, well, that's okay. You're in the right place. These temporary things, we're, we're all, we, every single one of us has a propensity towards this. I dream of the day that one of the teams that I cheer for wins a championship. But guess what? Even when that day comes, and it will come. <laughs> even when that day comes, guess what? The joy is going to fade. The joy is going to fade because there's always next season. And next season represents great disappointment. <laughs> we do this all the time. Maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. Let's learn from the life of Solomon and understand there is not even enough that will ever satiate the need that we have unless, unless we're putting our hope and our faith in something that isn't temporary. There's a second idea that I want to kind of highlight that Solomon brings up in these words. He talks about history repeating itself. How many of you enjoyed history in school, geography? Some of you are lying right now. <laughs> How many of you have enjoyed history after school? I know there's some of you who are like, oh, yeah, this wasn't so bad. It's because nobody's marking you anymore, right? <laughs> when you study human history, you're going to see patterns all over the place. Literally, History repeating itself, like a cycle, like a hamster wheel, time and time again. I was devastated when I heard of yet another conflict in the Middle East. Like how many more times does that area of our world need to be fighting within itself? It's, it's a cycle. 
Every few years, well, let's beat each other up. Let's beat each other up. Let's beat each other up. You see that in our political landscape. Let's beat each other up. Let's beat each other up. Let's beat each other up. We'll flip-flop from this brand to that brand, and that'll be better, but then we'll go back to the other brand, and then we'll go to this brand because they gave us a better deal, and then we'll go over here because they gave us a better deal. We'll swap churches like that too. Be like, ah, they are telling me what I need to hear right now, so I'm going to go join them. History repeats itself all over the place. What we need to know and what we need to understand is that we cannot rely on our circumstances to bring us the joy that we desire. In the moments where everything is going well, it's easy to say, yay, Jesus. But in the moments where things are not going well, do we curse them instead? Have you uttered this prayer just even in your own heart and in your own head, you know, nobody else to hear it, but like, why are you doing this to me? This is all your fault. I trusted you and now this happens. I invested in people and now they stab me in the back. I loved my neighbor and now they're moving and now somebody new is coming and I don't want to love them. I gave you my kids and now they've turned their backs on me. I taught them to know you and now they deny you. History repeats itself, and that can be very depressing unless we understand that the author of history is somebody that can transcend those patterns. Somebody that can take all the, beauty, all, all the brokenness around us and turn it into something magnificent. In his time, that's the problem. It's always in his time. It's not in our time. Sometimes we want the instantaneous gratification. We have way too much of that in our world. I was in the McDonald's drive through the other day, not for myself, by the way, <laughs> just putting, just confessing that. I waited for five minutes and 37 seconds. Can you believe that? <laughs> in a drive through my car was idling. I was adding to the carbon problem. I got to the window and I was frustrated. Has that ever happened to you? History repeats itself, but Jesus is someone we can know that transcends the patterns. See, some of us fear our own personal history. We grew up in a household that maybe was less than awesome. Maybe we suffered abuse of some kind. Maybe we suffered neglect of some kind. Maybe we often felt overlooked. Maybe we didn't feel loved. So we have this great fear that wells inside of us going like, what if this is a pattern? What if this is a habit? What if this is something that repeats itself as I connect with other people, as I have my own family, as I develop friendships, as I create community around me? What if they do the same thing to me that happened when I was young? And we hear that statement, history repeats itself, and we can be like, I'm just going to exit stage left now. But the truth is, those patterns in our lives, those patterns in our history, those patterns in our culture do not need to be what dictates our way forward. We can hang on to something that is true. That's certified authentic. And we can trust in a God who is far greater than what we can conjure up in our own understanding and even in our own desire. There's a third quick thing that I want to highlight, and that's that perspective is everything. See, the book of Ecclesiastes starts out pretty depressing. Everything is meaningless. There's nothing that we can do that's new under the sun. For those of you that have an entrepreneurial, adventurous spirit, that is like the worst thing that anybody can tell you. Oh, it's been done before. Shoot, I don't want to do it anymore. 
But there's this idea that perspective is everything. As you read through the rest of Ecclesiastes, you can hear the words of the teacher transcending his experience. Of Solomon sharing, okay, here's here's my starting point. But as his perspective changes and shifts and his circumstances maybe don't shift in the way that he was hoping they would be shifted, he finds hope. He finds light in the middle of the darkness. And I can't help but think that that's exactly what we need when we are experiencing depression on a personal level, on a societal level, or even on a global level. We need a little bit of hope. When we check our stocks and they're down 46%, we need a little bit of hope. We call the person managing our fund, and then we, you know, give them an earful. And if that person is you, you yell at yourself in the mirror. We need a little bit of hope. Sometimes hope shines most brightly in the darkest of places. And it's recognizing that when we find ourselves in a space where, where everything seems to be closing in on us, when, when we can't pull ourselves up anymore, when we are depressed, it's in that moment our greatest triumph and breakthrough might actually be incubating. Waiting, germinating for the right moment. And we won't know unless we speak up. Unless we seek God. Unless we invite him into that place. And here's the crazy thing. He's already present in that space with us. Sometimes we just need the perspective to recognize we're not alone. I hesitate to use this word because sometimes when I use it, people think this is the only way forward. But I wanted to leave you with a little bit of hope here this morning. So... I've, I've written up a little bit of a prescription, not because I'm a doctor, not because I can diagnose you. If you've got clinical depression, you need to go see a medical professional. And if medical aids are a part of their transformative plan for you, that's okay. Sometimes we need to do a system shock, a system reboot in order to function correctly. You all have had access to a computer. You know that the reboot is a true thing, especially if it's a PC. You know what PC stands for, right? I'll let you figure that one out. (laughs) You call any tech support company in the world, the first thing that they will say to you, did you power cycle your stuff? Okay. Sometimes a power cycle is in the form of medication. Sometimes it's in the form of conversation. So I wanted to write you a little bit of a prescription. I wanted to write me a little bit of a prescription when I'm feeling that depression is starting to creep in on the fringes of my life or becoming core to who I am. What the heck do I do? It starts with making Jesus central. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. When we have Jesus as our side piece, our thing, our add-on, we're never going to fully understand the hope and the life that he has for us. How do you know if Jesus is your central thing? Who do you go to first when chaos strikes? Do you Google and say, Hey, Google, what's the life expectancy of somebody suffering with melanoma? Hey, Google, how do I tell my neighbor I don't like them without letting them know? Do we phone a friend? Be like, hey, that person's a Jesus person. Can you pray for me? Meanwhile, we are unwilling to pray for ourselves. Can we make Jesus central in all things? In the moments when we are experiencing triumph, that's a lot easier to do. But in the moments when we are experiencing defeat, is Jesus still central? Next thing that we can do that many experts will suggest is exercising our brains 
Sometimes when depression sets in, it's because we ruminate on our circumstances and the things that are creating the weight around us. And sometimes anxiety and and depression, they become like best friends and they're magnets for one another and they keep pulling you down into the depths of your very being, trying to help you understand that from their perspective, there's no way out. You are victim to them. But that's not true. Sometimes we just need to exercise our brain differently. Try something new. Learn a new language. There are so many helps out there that are free. Duolingo is one of them. Sign up, learn learn a new language. Spanish, French, Punjabi. I don't care what it might be. Do something different with your brain. Focus it away from the things and the experiences that are weighing you down. Find a way forward. Next thing that I would suggest, again, as Jesus is central, he can help you prioritize what needs to happen in your world. And so you go to him and you ask him to help you set some goals and make decisions. Sometimes those of us that procrastinate making decisions in our lives become overwhelmed by all the additional decisions that get pending decisions that get added to the the recipe and the concoction that is the reality in which we are living And so learning to set goals and make decisions actually creates layers of freedom. A decision could be like, what am I going to wear in the morning? How about clothing? Start there. That's great. If that's the only decision that you can make in the day, you are still winning. Set goals, make some decisions. Next one is give your brain a rest. Find something that actually nourishes you. Maybe it's taking a walk in nature. Maybe it's going for a little bit of a a kayak adventure. Maybe it's having a good, dare I say it, good cup of coffee and sitting by the fire and reading a book. Maybe it's watching a movie. Maybe it's just listening to a great conversation or a podcast but it's resting your brain from the things that are exhausting it. Next thing is taking advantage of biofeedback. Our bodies, our physical well-being is interwoven with our mental well-being, our spiritual well-being, our emotional well-being. Sometimes the indicator for what is going on in our lives manifests physically first. Many of you know that a couple of years ago, my brother-in-law was killed in a workplace accident at a place in Calgary. The three times I've driven past that place, my body has had a physiological response. It's weird. I don't know why, but it does. And it's an indicator to me like, oh, okay, that's still painful. I'm tender there. So you might have a physiological response. Your body might be like, I just feel tired all the time. Something else might be happening. You might be stress eating. That's a physiological response. Why am I eating enough for seven people? Oh, weird. I'm not pregnant, so therefore. Here's one that's really appropriate for the day and the weekend that we are in. Activate a gratitude circuit. Can we literally write down the things that we are thankful for? In the lowest of lows, can we hang on to those things? Are the things that are on our list that we're thankful for temporary, or do they have eternal value? And lastly, we learn to leverage the power and influence of others in our lives, learning to be discipled. What does that mean, Jason? It means being willing to link arm in arm with people And to let them in on our stuff and together collectively make Jesus central in our relationship, in our conversation, in our commitment to one another. That's hard. I get it. It's not easy. I'm human too. I understand if if people really knew Jason offstage and Jason onstage, would they still enjoy me? Some of you are like, nope, I would not. Because you don't like the onstage, Jason. <laughs> and that's okay. Not 
Can we link arms with people? Can we bring them into our space? I'm not saying everybody. I'm not saying use social media to link arms with strangers. I'm talking about two, three, maybe four people in your relational circle that you can go deep with. Discovering who Jesus is with one another. And maybe you're here today and just going like, yeah, that's, that's where I am. I just don't even know who Jesus is. Here's the Coles Notes version. Jesus is the person that will always love you no matter what. Jesus is the person that will never abandon you no matter what you have done, will do, or are doing. Jesus is the person that will lovingly course correct you and tell you when you're doing something really stupid. Jesus is the person that is willing to stand in the gap when you can't stand on your own. Jesus is the one that will provide for your needs and help you learn the difference between what a need and what a want is. And sometimes that's massive. Jesus is the one who willingly gave his life so you could live. Making Jesus central is all about coming back to that point of recognizing our need for him. So if that's you here today, whether you've been walking in the world of church for 55 years or five minutes, I'm just going to invite you to pray with me. We're going to pray a prayer of hopefulness. We're going to pray a prayer of Jesus-oriented, making him central in our lives. And as I pray, may these words of hope nourish you, inspire you, and lovingly guide you where you need to be. Let's pray. Father, I confess that sometimes when we get depressed, we don't know what to do. And so I pray that ever increasingly we would be willing to turn to you. I don't know everybody's story in this space. I don't know everybody's story who's watching online or listening to this much later, but you do. And so in the In their narrative at this moment, I pray that you would help them to see how they can make you central. Give them words, curiosity, desire, or hopefulness in the midst of all of the weight and the stuff that is lingering around them. God, the word that comes to my heart and my mind as I think about these people is freedom. I think too many of us are stuck in old habits and patterns. I think too many of us are stuck doing stuff that makes us feel good in the moment, but it's actually killing us. Whether that's addicted to things or pornography or the lust of money, the approval of people, the desire to achieve our next level and status. God, would you forgive each one of us for that reality and instead remind us of your invitation to be made whole when we place our entire being, our entire being, not our fragmented self, our entire being, in you. For anyone here today, Father, that wants to reach out to you, I pray that you'd grant them words, draw them close, help them to recognize your ever-enduring love and your gentle course correction when we deviate from what's best. Would you bless us and protect us? Would you make your face shine upon us, be gracious to us, Would you grant us your favor and your peace? We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.